is a channel that focuses on high school biology. We want to continue to communicate science related to the current COVID-19 pandemic and COVID-19 vaccinations. In February, we were able to ask questions of a CDC Epidemic Intelligence Service officer about the mRNA vaccines available for COVID-19. We learned about the rigorous process for how the COVID-19 vaccines are studied and authorized. We both recently had our COVID-19 vaccinations, and we want to help find ways to address the concerns and misconceptions about the COVID-19 vaccines that our audience may have. Some of these are questions that were in our video comments from our previous video, and others are comments that we sometimes read on other forms of social media. To help us address some of these, we are so excited to have Dr. Kate O'Brien joining us. Dr. O'Brien is a physician, epidemiologist, and also the director of the Immunizations, Vaccines, and Biologicals Department of the World Health Organization. You can read more about Dr. O'Brien in the expanded video description. And in the style of our videos, while I ask Dr. O'Brien some of these questions, Petunia will be illustrating some of the responses. Dr. O'Brien, thank you so much for being here virtually and being willing to answer these questions for us. And I have a few questions that have shown up on our comments that we'd really like to get addressed um, regarding COVID-19 vaccinations. And so my first question is, we've seen some comments on YouTube that claim the vaccines have tracking devices or toxins or poisons. Can you talk a little bit about those type of comments? Um, so that's such an important question. And I'm so happy to be here with you to, um, to answer any questions you have about um, vaccines in general and COVID vaccine in particular. So all vaccines you know, work in the same way. What they're trying to do, what they aim to do is to provide to our own natural immune system um, some small component of the germ that we're trying to prevent disease from. And that allows the immune system to be trained to respond to that germ when it actually encounters it in the natural setting. And the way that vaccines do that is that um, all vaccines contain in some way, either the instructions for this tiny part of uh, the, the pathogen or a tiny part of the pathogen itself or a weakened part of the pathogen. And then in addition to that component, which we would call the active component of the vaccine, there are other parts of the vaccine for injectable vaccines or oral vaccines Obviously there's a liquid involved so that it can in fact be injected or taken orally or nasally, in fact. Um, there are also um, other components that are in the product. We, we do have preservatives in vaccines so that uh, over time they have a shelf life uh, to them. Secondly, there are some vaccines that need another component which is called an adjuvant and an adjuvant is basically a booster of the immune system. It helps the immune system respond in a stronger way to that active part of the vaccine. And then um, in some vaccines, they do require stabilizers of the vaccine so that the components of the vaccine don't kind of fall apart um, in, in the vial itself. But I know that there are also, um, we've heard a lot about rumors um, uh, among people on, the, on uh, social media that, um, that are really concerned about whether there are things like microchips or tracking devices or even toxic materials in vaccines. Um, and I wanna really assure everybody that um, every component that's in the vaccine is in there for a purpose related to the immune system. Um, every component is there because it has to be in the vaccine, that every vaccine is tested for each of the components that is in it for the safety of those components. Um, and there is no truth to the, um, to the rumors that there are things like microchips or tracking devices um, in, in vaccines. So here's our second question. There are some that ask why a vaccination that protects against the virus that causes COVID-19 was able to be developed in the time frame it was. While there are some viral infections such as HIV or the common cold that do not yet have a vaccine, can you explain why that would be expected? Well, first of all, it wasn't expected. It was not expected that we would be able to successfully develop one, or in fact, we've got you know, more than 10 vaccines that have um, been shown to be uh, protective against COVID. 
um, and safe and to be produced with quality manufacturing. Those are the three components for a vaccine really to be a vaccine that can be used. Um, so uh, frankly, you know, this has exceeded most people's expectations. Um, what I would say is that uh, the coronavirus that is causing this pandemic um, has turned out to be a relatively simple um, virus to produce a vaccine against. And the reason is that it has a really clear target um, on the virus itself. It's this spike protein. I think we've all seen pictures, drawings of what the virus kind of looks like. And it has these spikes on the outside of uh, the virus. And those are the target that the immune system can attack um, and can protect you against getting um, disease from, from COVID. And so um, this has actually been successful in part so quickly because there's so many um, uh, in new vaccines that are being, um, being developed against COVID. It's kind of like having shots on goal in hockey or football or soccer or you know, uh, whatever, whatever sport you're talking about. If you're trying to score a goal, the more shots you have on goal, the more likely you're gonna have at least one that's gonna work. Um, and so because the whole world has been responding to the pandemic, we have over 200 candidate vaccines that have been in develop or continued in development or continue to be in development. And we've we've now seen the success of some of those vaccines coming through the clinical trial development. Unfortunately, there are other viruses, and I think HIV is probably the best example, that in spite of billions of dollars of development. Uh, funding and efforts to develop vaccines that would be successful, and many vaccines that have actually gone into human clinical trials. The HIV virus itself is a really difficult virus to work with. It evades the immune system. It has strategies as a virus for mutating that actually hides itself from the immune system. So it's been um, a, an area of intense vaccine development. And there have been some successes of vaccines, but they've been insufficient um, to actually warrant proceeding with the further development of those vaccines. But we're still working on HIV vaccines. And I think you will start to see um, more trials happening with HIV vaccines. And we really hope that some of those strategies are going to work. So a lot of questions come up about whether or not, why don't we have a, a vaccine against the common cold? Um, and I'd like to answer that in a couple of ways. First of all, the common cold is not caused by one single virus. Um, there are actually many viruses that cause the same set of symptoms. So if we were gonna develop a vaccine against the common cold, it's actually multiple vaccines, some of which are coronaviruses. In fact, um, there are um, plenty of coronaviruses they do cause respiratory illnesses, um, but uh, for the ones that have been around before, they certainly don't cause the severity of disease that uh, SARS-CoV-2 has, has caused. And so part of the reason why we don't have virus, uh, we don't have vaccines against the common cold is because there are so many different viruses that cause those symptoms. And also because, um, because the common cold is not a severe disease, um, when you think about the, the benefit and the cost of vaccines, um, there may not be that compelling reason why uh, people would um, want, to, want the vaccine or that um, the health system would put um, that as a highest priority for putting funding behind. So those, are, so those are really the two reasons why we don't have vaccines against the common cold. We have seen comments that compare the COVID-19 disease process to the flu and have asked why flu cases and flu deaths are down during the COVID-19 pandemic. Can you address how this pandemic has statistically been different from the flu and why flu cases have been down this past year? So there have been a lot of comparisons between flu and COVID. Um, first, to address why we're seeing um, fewer influenza cases this year than we have in past years, it's actually quite simple. And um, the answer to that is that because of the interventions to limit and prevent the spread of SARS-CoV-2, co the COVID virus, um, people are not interacting with each other. 
and influenza is spread from person to person. Because of the, the social uh, physical distancing limitations that we've all been practicing and the masking and the hand washing, we're actually seeing a reduction in plenty of respiratory viruses that otherwise cause disease on a pretty predictable basis. So flu is not the only one that has been um, really reduced. I think it's been a, essentially a, an, an, a, a demonstrated experiment um, across populations, communities, and families around the world that we do know how to prevent respiratory diseases when they're spread from person to person, masking when you're ill, washing your hands, limiting your exposure to um, other people when you're sick actually stops the transmission of these viruses. So really big lesson for everybody that we do know how to intervene. And for flu in particular, we also have a vaccine against flu. Flu and, and uh, COVID are not the same. The severity of COVID disease, the frequency with which it's transmitted among people because it's a new virus, there is really no immunity um, in, 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 in among people around the world. And that's what's really driven the response to COVID because of the rapid um, increase in the number of serious cases, hospitalized cases, cases of people who needed intensive care unit care um, and people who died. Um, and we're still seeing that around the world. So this is what um, causes the, you know, is the difference between flu and COVID is really the risk of severe disease and the rapid spread of this virus around the world to people who are all not immune. Some comments have repeatedly stated a survival statistic of COVID-19 and the number that we see the most from the comments is this quote unquote 99.7% survival rate. And we're not actually sure where this number comes from. And we wanna get into the significance of the statistics for this disease. Is that statistic about survival rate accurate? And is the survival statistic a good indicator of how concerned we should be about COVID-19? Well, <clears throat> I think the most important thing is not to be looking at among people who get infected, um, what the likelihood is of dying. I think what's a more important statistic is um, what is the likelihood of actually getting disease? And if you get disease, what is your likelihood of having a severe outcome? We're in this situation with this pandemic because disease is spreading like wildfire in some countries around the world and has moved from country to country in terms of its um, size and dimension of the pandemic. Um, and the number of cases of severe disease um, risks overwhelming the healthcare system, which is not designed uh, to accommodate large numbers of people who have no immunity to this virus and a fraction of them will get hospitalized, will require oxygen, a fraction of those will require intensive care. And unfortunately, people will die. And we've seen that. We're now over 3 million deaths from COVID um, around the world and, uh, and hundreds of millions of, of cases. And so this number of 99.7% survival um, can, come, can come from measuring those people who get infected, some people are completely asymptomatic. Some people have no symptoms at all, and yet they can nevertheless transmit to other people um, the, the infection. But among those who develop disease, um, the rate of mortality, the rate of death really does vary also according to um, your underlying risk factors, the age that you are, um, and other diseases that you have. And it varies geographically and over time. Unfortunately, at the beginning of this pandemic, it was a new disease, the kind of respiratory illness that people got. It was not totally clear how to treat them best, what the best treatments would be. Um, and as we've gotten a clearer understanding of the, um, the, the nature of the illness, um, we've gotten better in the medical care system for treating people, but nevertheless, um, there continue to be substantial numbers of, of deaths among people. So that's what we're trying to, to prevent. All right. And our very last question, we know that after a vaccination, the human body experiences an immune response. And we know that sometimes this results in side effects, which are usually temporary. 
And while my personal response was mild, sore arm for a while, I know that's anecdotal because that's just my experience. We would like to know the actual data about side effects. Can you give us some information about the current data of side effects from COVID-19 vaccinations? And based on it, what would you tell someone who is concerned about side effects? Sure. Um, everybody who goes to get a vaccine wants to know what's going to happen to me after I get this vaccine and am I going to have some side effects. Um, the information that we have about each of the vaccines that's authorized for use is that they're incredibly safe vaccines. They've now been given to hundreds of millions of people around the world. In fact, over 1 billion doses of these vaccines have been administered around the world um, in 2021. Um, and beginning in late 2020. And we have surveillance systems to monitor for safety events. But from the clinical trials, we know that it's, it's quite common for people to have um, local and time-limited um, mild or moderate uh, side effects, a sore arm, redness for some, swelling for some. Some people have headache. Um, some can also have fever. Some just don't feel well. Um, almost a, a, as if they might have a viral infection. These are really time-limited side effects, 24 hours, 48 hours. People can certainly take ibuprofen or acetaminophen um, to manage the symptoms. In very rare circumstances, um, there are more serious side effects. Um, and um, there's, a, there's a range of what those are. We don't have to go into the details of them, um, but I think what's most important to understand is these are incredibly rare side effects um, that are the serious side effects. And um, in spite of um, some of the vaccines that have these very rare side effects, the benefit of the vaccine for, for each individual far outweighs the risk of those side effects. Um, vaccines are uh, assessed for safety during the course of the development of the vaccine. We continue to monitor for safety events even after vaccines are authorized by the regulator in the country, in the case of the United States, the FDA. And we continue to monitor um, anything that happens related to vaccines so that if there are rare events they're identified as quickly as possible. They're evaluated. Warnings are given to physicians and to the general public so people know what to look for and they can then be managed um, and treated for those um, uh, rare events that do occur. Thank you so much for your answers with these questions. I really appreciate it. And we really appreciate your time. Thank you for having me. It was really fun and a real pleasure. Well. That's it for the Amoeba Sisters, and we remind you to stay curious.